No gum? Do you want gum? No. Gone. <laughs> see it se seven years later. Dude, that's a that perfect gum. way to start. I love it. <laughs> so now that you've swallowed your gum. Well, thanks for doing this. I appreciate yeah. it, man. Thank you. Um, I usually like to start in the back, in the past. Um, I'm really curious. Your roots, music, where you were raised. Um, so is it Georgia? Is that uh, where it starts for you? Or? My formative years were in southwestern Virginia. Okay, so Virginia. What was the first musical band or person that you latched onto and sort of made you realize, like, oh, I could have a go at this? Well, um, so I grew up uh, in an area, well, I grew up in the area of Virginia that, where you identify by the county that you live in. Okay. So I, I grew up in Rockbridge County, Virginia, uh, which is where the first four or five iterations of uh, Baroness were all, all originated from, even though we were operating out of uh, Savannah, Georgia. And in southwestern Virginia, in the late 80s through the 90s, um, there really wasn't a music scene to speak of. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, in the town in the town that I grew up uh, in, there there weren't there weren't many organized bands, and the ones that did exist either played country music, bluegrass, or were you know on the you know sort of burgeoning new wave of jam band thing. Oh, like Dave Matthews <laughs> yeah. from about half or forty five minutes away. Okay. Um, and so there, so there was a lot of that happening, and that's what people listen, that's what kids my age, you know, primarily listen to. You know, all the kids with older brothers and sisters. Uh, I did not have any older siblings, so I didn't have that. Uh, Someone to pass it down to you. I didn't, yeah, I didn't. I didn't have anybody older to pass down their musical taste. You know, I think thankfully. And in you know in those years where I, I was you know coming of age and I started to have some choice over what I listened to and what I was uh, involved in, with that w that w really was when you know when grunge broke and when Nirvana became a big thing okay yeah okay so MTV was all I had for for many years I was you know I was as even when I was younger you know MTV was always something that that I watched and uh, those were the songs I was familiar with so when yeah, if you're not connected to a scene, there's no internet. That's, right. that's the way to, to get into it, for sure. Yeah, and that's how, that's how I learned how to play music. Just you watch MTV and you try to keep your guitar sounding similar to the one on the, you know, on the screen. And so Nirvana was revelatory to me because along with them came, you know, along with this band that should, for all intents and purposes, have remained an underground thing, for them to become this gigantic, mm. uh, you know, worldwide phenomenon, meant that everybody that they were associated with, all of their influences and reference points, and all of their peers, also, you know, rose up at the same time. Hence the Seattle sound, the Seattle right. scene. In the in the months following uh, my discovery of Nirvana, I discovered, um, you know, tape trading. I discovered uh, seven inches and mail order. And I started, you know, I started reading punk fanzines like MRR yeah. and the, yeah. thing, the things I could get. And I yeah. couldn't get them locally. I had to travel, you know, we had to travel to get those. Go to the things. record store and order it if they didn't have it type thing. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. we'd have to go to the record store in Roanoke, Virginia or Charlottesville. We'd have yeah. to drive an hour no matter what to get anything, wow, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, being wired the way that I was and with a few other kids that had, you know, the same sort of disillusioned tendencies that, that I did, we got, we got really deep into collecting seven inches and we got really involved in a punk scene that wasn't happening close to us. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the nearest and biggest thing would have been Fugazi, but that's still hours away. Yeah. Uh, so f the idea that there was, you know, a gang of seven or eight punks in a small town in southwestern Virginia was, you know, me meant that we were, in, we were hermetically sealed from the tour circuit, from, yeah. any, from record stores that would stock new stuff. So what, what were you in school at this time? Was this like high school, junior yeah, high? Yeah, I, uh, I was in middle school. So obviously, you know, and I, and I get it too, because when I was younger, I didn't relate to the mainstream. I didn't relate to like what my peers were doing, et cetera. Did you experience uh, were people picking on you? Like, 
were you getting into fights? Was any of that going on, or were you just yeah? Kind of I mean, of, of course. I think I, I think especially when you're in a rural community that uh, that you know where where there is a status quo, no matter no matter what. Uh, you know the the outsiders and the the fringe, the people on the fringe with with interests that fell way outside of mm. the status quo. I think, of course, there's going to be, uh, you know, some segmenting of the teen societies. You know, there were getting there were, called a freak or whatever the case. Yeah, be. but that was that was the appeal of it. it kind <laughs> of to begin. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, like fire, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that music was great music to begin with, but but. Additionally, it had the you know the primary benefit of uh, allowing me to you know to be somewhere else uh, you know that 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 a lot of the people around me weren't, mm. and that that antagonism was what I what I wanted and what I needed at the time. You know, I wanted something that nobody else. You know, when I when I say nobody else, I mean I mean like the kids in my classroom. I wanted things that they didn't have. Mm. I wanted to be interested in things that 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 they didn't have access to, uh, and you know that's just me being young and idealistic and thinking that you know that I'm better than everybody else, which is you know completely false. But it did allow me to discover punk. It fuels and, your fire. Yeah, and yeah. through discovering punk, I actually uh, and the DIY community that that then I became interested in and ultimately involved in, um, you know, it sort of gave me a loose set of structures and ideologies that. I have been applying ever since then. Awesome. Now, at the same time, you're you're into art and illustration. Yes. Now, that was that solely for you, or was it anything you were showing? Did you ever like have the notion of like, I want to share my art with people at that age in high school, or is it more for you, in your own world? Well, it's hard to say because I, you know, I had I had I certainly had a visual art interest as a an incredibly young uh, child, and my musical interests came, you know, shortly thereafter. Those were always two things that I that I I did. They were just part of my day, you mm. know. Uh, I didn't have to. What were you drawing back then in high school? Uh, I was doing, you know, I was doing some formal stuff because even at a very very young age, my mother was uh, had introduced me to life drawing classes, so I was familiar with, uh, you know, the, these very um, history sort of formats by which you, you know, work with a, a live model mm -hmm. and draw what's in front of you or, you know, the idea of painting a still life and these, mm -hmm. these are, those were all part of what I did. But in addition to that, I was, you know, I was into comics, I was into films and fantasy fiction and uh, so what I did was I used the stuff that, uh, you know, I used the things that were around me as practice and I'd draw the flowers, I'd draw, you know, portraits of people, I'd, I'd, you know, all sorts of things. And then when I learned how to control that a little bit, then it just was, you know, imaginative stuff. Mm -hmm. And so... Do you ever uh, get into comics or anything like that? Do you ever I don't, that? I've never attempted to draw comics. The, the, the format doesn't suit the way that I work, which gotcha. is super laborious, labor intensive, yeah. like microscopic. You got to be fast to do that, and I'm jealous of people who, who have yeah, that. I had friends that wrote comics. That's why I was curious. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is. I like, read a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I like to think that I read the good ones because uh, they had, you know, compositions and and uh, colors and ideas that that I thought applied, you know, in, on a much larger scale than mm. you know just just a comic. But, you know, I did whatever. I you know, if I was. It seems like a weaver. I wanted to make sculpture. I made sculpture. Yeah, it seems like art is just very much a part of who you are, without yeah. even having to say it. it. Just sort of. I mean, it's. It's always seemed like it's all that I am, and at times, like, in a frightening way. Hmm. But when I was young, it was that. That was where I felt the most free. That was where I felt uh, driven, and uh, it was a comfortable place to be working all the time and, and you know I didn't consider it work at that, that point I wouldn't have I would never have said I'm working on artwork I'm just you know I was just making stuff yeah. that's crazy you just have to stop me from doing that sometimes yeah. in order to you know go play sports or go to school or whatever uh, and even in the context of school I that's all that all I did all day long in every class was uh, pictures in the margins of the worksheets that we were working yes, on our notebooks that's great. hundreds of thousands of pages that I just filled with nonsense and so that thoughts so that being said it seems like it's an obvious thing that you would have that artistic feel 
bleed into your music. So when Baroness first started, did you have any sort of a vision or were you just a, applying the way you are to the music without a discussion of it? I think it was, I think it was, there was definitely a bit of both, you know, from the onset Baroness was never meant to be my ideas mm. supported by other musicians. It was meant, it was meant to be collaborative and the, you know, the first structured conversation, the, the, maybe the only conversation that we had as we were starting the band was that um, whatever direction we would take musically that it would, we, were, we would always be creatively free to follow a different path. Mm. Uh, so you and, weren't setting out to be a particular... No, 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 we, we were setting out to be, in particular, anything other than something we had heard. Right. I mean, that's, that was our goal, was just awesome. to be a, a, an entirely unique musical entity. I don't, I don't what, think it's possible, and what but age, it's, What age was this when this was like, where were you? Was this high school? Uh, no, we, Baroness started in uh, around the summer of uh, 2002, or between the summer 2002, 2003. Okay. There were... The, all of the musicians, and this was in Savannah, Georgia, all of the musicians that I played with for the first seven or eight years of the band grew up in the same county eight and a half hours north of there. Oh, that's so interesting. So when our initial guitar player uh, decided to leave, then we got our drummer's brother. When our drummer's brother decided to leave, uh, then we got you know one of my oldest friends in the world, Pete, to, jo to join the band. Yeah, and then, yeah. That worked for a long, it worked for a long time until I, you know we had effectively exhausted you know everybody that I was from, you know friends with from my hometown that, that was you know interested and capable of of, of playing in the band. Um, but there, you know, I think we we always had that we always have had this uh, idealism that's one hundred percent unattainable, which is that we do something that's never been done before. Mm. that we configure our musical output in such a way that we're saying something brand new and something that's, you know, that, that, has, that has never been said before and, you know, maybe could never be said again. I, again, I, I admit that that's, you know, even then, at the, at, this, at the time we started, and I was in my early 20s with Baroness, it wasn't something we thought was possible. It was just something that, it was a mindset that we had to be in mm. in order to grow because we weren't, None of us. That's super. We're great. Man. We weren't great musicians. Yeah, you know, we were learning as we, we were learning as we went along. So that frame of mind is is exceptional, though, because at a young age, you know, especially when you're first starting out in music, a lot of people just mimic what they hear, and to hear you say that you were just kind of wanted to be the antithesis of that, right, is pretty fucking amazing, dude. Yeah, but and so in order in order to to try to meet those uh, criteria. I think what we were doing was we were listening to bands who we felt had some element of that. So we were mimicking. I mean, everybody. You, yeah, if you course. play music, you mimic something. Yeah, yeah. But we were we weren't mimicking popular bands. We were mimicking the the bands we found most interesting, and they they were the you know they tended to be sort of the popular underground bands, but they weren't. Uh, so you I know, commercial I, success was wasn't you know that wasn't a factor in in music, and in, it, it in fact you know I think. Uh, you know, I've met plenty, I've met a ton of musicians since 2003, and I've realized that everybody starts from a, a wildly different place, or people can start from wildly different places. Some people start with all the musical training in the world, and with all the theories mm. and knowledge uh, of, you know, classical, classically arranged and, and performed music in mind, and then try to uh, hyper-focus and, and, and find a direction that way. I started off with very limited skills and a very uh, a very limited voice, and the the whole the idea the whole time and still and continuing through the future is to just add to that palette and to grow outwards, like uh, well from a like from a radial point, like we're we start in the center mm. and we move outwards on all axes, uh, rather than you know rather than move forward. It's a great way to describe it. So. The trick is, every time we've recorded an album, is not to repeat that album, mm. you know, insofar as we're capable, and then to balance that against what we what we know and what we identify as our sound. Uh, so, you know, in other words, we want to do something different, but we don't want to lose the uh, the innate the barrenness yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, 
it's not that difficult if you apply your gut to it. Yeah. You know, it's not that difficult if you apply your heart to it. It's more difficult when you analyze before you feel something. Mm. So, so typically anything we do just starts off as like an excited idea or uh, something that feels right and then gets massaged and, uh, and worked over until it, it's, you know, as intricate and baroque as, you know, as it can be. That's such a refreshing way to hear m music being described. I feel like in this day and age of, you know, the oversaturation that we have with the internet and music in general, I mean, I, I still gravitate towards those underground bands that moved and shaped me when I was younger, whether it be, um, I think we definitely have this in common, Neurosis was one of those bands that when I initially heard them, yeah. it struck a, co a chord in me that was left of center. It wasn't something, you know, with hardcore for me, there was the aggression, there was the message. Yeah. And then with Neurosis, it just felt like, you know, if you're in an art gallery and you're looking at a piece of classical art, you get it, it's structured a certain way. And then going and seeing like a modern art painting where it's just, it takes you a while to figure out what's the intent behind this artist. But it comes, it comes down through the ages, through that history of classical mm -hmm. art. It's a, it's a gradual refinement of all that's been done before it. And I, I think as musicians and as artists, we have to realize that we're part of a much greater whole. No one of us in theory is any better or worse than anybody else. Some of us are more popular or less popular or uh, you know, some of us make things that are easier to digest mm -hmm. or more abstract and more you know, abrasive. But you know, as if, we, if we apply artistry to what we do, um, and that's not necessarily the case with music or art. There's a commercial aspect to it course, that you can, you can focus on entirely. Right. Uh, I've just had to make sure and, uh, that regardless of you know, where our careers have taken us and regardless of where we are at any given point in time, that the notion of saleability isn't the first thought. Mm -hmm. Like, look, if we make something that's great and that excites us and that, that satisfies us and you know, uh, represents the band or you know, artistically for me, if, if it represents turning a page or crossing some threshold that wasn't available before, then that's where we start with. That's mm -hmm. where we start. And if it's good, it'll find an audience. If it's not, then great. We just failed and we learned something that we're no good at, you know? Yeah, no, I, I can relate to that because, you know, my, my history as a musician, you know, walking away from Kill Switch Engage in 2002, going on and doing other things, getting a job, sort of stepping away from that whole world and then coming back into it going on five years ago, it was very eye-opening to see a band that's achieved success in the commercial world and has written songs in a particular structure that work within those confines. Right. And uh, as I get older, the more I'm like, it's, I get it and I enjoy what I do, but it's also like there's a, a desire for more. And I've been able to branch out and do other projects, but just hearing you speak about the artistry behind music it's just so refreshing, man. It's great. Well, I, I, I don't think it's a unique thought. I mean, I, I've, I've definitely spent but the a way lot you're long speaking about, about it. it yeah. The way you're speaking about it is, is definitely different from, you're wording it differently than I've heard anyone word it. But, you know, the thing is to, in order to, in order to maintain this, this mentality, you come face to face with then some of the difficult realities of that, which is, uh, not everybody wants to be part of a project that occasionally entertains notions that are like bound to fail, <laughs> but where the yeah. failure is the process, the process of failing is, is, is the point, mm -hmm. you know, because there are, there are some, well, there are only lessons that you learn the hard way, right. in my opinion. Uh, and then everything else, you know, is, is sort of luck, I guess. Um, but, I, it just it, like it, I, it, does, it doesn't seem like an especially uh, unique thought to me. Perhaps because I've been fortunate enough to be around musicians who mm -hmm. seem to have some version of that uh, philosophy themselves, or just because I've never faltered in my belief in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
as as being important for me. You know, right, and if right. it's, if 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 the, if what the group is doing is something that the group believes is important, uh, because we have fun doing it, or right. because you know, in the best case scenario, we actually discover something. You know, uh, to to be getting older and still uh, still to maintain the capacity to discover new things and to be humbled by your lack of expertise while pushing forward, uh, that's, that's a lifelong goal. That's, that's, a, that's a lifelong pursuit and something mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, as an artist, it's, it's a noble pursuit um, because it allows that you never settle. Mm. You do have to, be, you know, there's, of course there's a balance. I'm presenting like one side of it. Then there's a balance where you, you know, eventually, you know, on a long enough timeline and with some modicum of success, then there's more people involved uh, who can oftentimes depend on your uh, availability to tour or, yeah. you know, you, you should put yeah. out an album every couple of years at least. Uh, and, and, you know, there's those sort of things that are details, but I don't, worry about them unduly because I know that there's, there just haven't been droughts in my life creatively. Mm -hmm. And when there is, when it feels like I'm getting writer's block uh, as a musician, I just make artwork. And when it feels like my art uh, is perhaps reaching a point of staleness, I just switch back to music. And then, it then, the, then returning to one or the other becomes fresh again. That's right on. So I got a question for you. I'm really curious about this. Um, when you're working on your artwork or when you're just doing your everyday stuff, and like you said earlier, you're pretty much nonstop, but uh, what music, what bands are you listening to that, you know, are around now? I mean, I'm, I'm a... I you name it. <laughs> here's a... Here's, here's a here's some, I'm and not a, even in the confines of heavy <clears throat> music, I'm just curious. The confines of heavy music would be incredibly limiting. Yeah. Uh, I believed for many years now that it's, that it's imperative for, for me to listen, if possible, every day to an album that I have yet to hear. Mm. Whether it's a classic album that, you know, I just didn't think was cool enough to listen to when I was younger, or if it's something I've genuinely missed, or if it's some, uh, if, it's a, if it's a new seven inch that's, that's come out and in the underground and it's, it's you know, I, I wanna hear it, uh, you know. But I also have to work my way back through pop music because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was. I wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, you know, if it was like, yeah. if it was slick, well-played music, I didn't care about it. You yeah, know? Yeah. So now I'm, you know, I'm going back and trying to, you know, trying to find my way through Steely Dan records yeah. or, uh, you know, all of 80s hip hop. There, I mean, there's just, there are so many genres of music. They all have amazing albums. Uh, the ones that are popular, the ones that you read about in the, you know, Rolling Stones list of, you know, however many records you got to hear before you pass on, um, they don't all hit that list. Yeah. So I'm always asking people what they're listening to. And then that's something, you know, I'll just make a note of it. And Likewise. I'll, I've been doing I'll that find it the next day. I've been doing a lot lately myself. <clears throat> it's exciting. And I, I love the idea of stepping way outside of the realm, especially when I'm writing. I don't know about you, but when I'm writing music, I'm currently writing a bunch of stuff. I listen to a lot of Brian Eno, a lot of ambient, a lot of like just simple stuff. And I even actually listen to white noise, like actual white yeah, noise. Yeah, I mean, I think anything right. that takes you out of the, like if, if you play music, you, you have, uh, your chances are you have some sort of style, you know, or mm. l that you uh, fit loosely into some sort of genre. I think the most compelling place for me to draw influence, uh, to make music that's ultimately gonna find its way in, in that genre is to look outside uh, because as musicians, we're just, I mean, there's, there's a set number of notes. It's finite. It's right. incredibly finite. And you just have to repeat yourself. Well, hopefully not only not, that, but, it, but not, all music yeah. is, is just a, uh, they're just different variations on the same notes. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just kind of, you know, a math problem that you don't, you know, it doesn't need to work logically in order to be satisfactory, but it is, there, there are some real uh, boundaries to, you know, the number of notes that you can make. So. I'll look very often outside of uh, the styles that I'm most closely associated with for good ideas that I can work into our music mm -hmm. in a way that suits me. And we try that, you know, in Baroness, we try that a lot. Sometimes it doesn't work, but the four of us, you know, it's our duty as musicians to be bullshit detectors. And when 
somebody says something, let's try this, not to shoot, there's no, there, like, there really aren't bad ideas. You have, to, you have to be accepting of any idea, and as soon as, it, <laughs> as, soon as you try to execute that idea, if it, if it comes off as disingenuous or uh, just false in some way, then, then, you, then, it, then it hits the cutting room floor. But at least you've had a go at yeah, it. Yeah, but you don't, you don't toss out uh, any sort of musical idea without trying it. Because how it's you know if you've come up with the idea, if you, if your brain is capable of coming up with the idea, then that means there's you have some chance of putting it and you know putting the idea into form, and then it's just, then it's your job as 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 the artist, a cura curator of your own music, to judge whether or not what you've done is is going to work. Mm. Uh, and you know that's why I say you got you sort of got to trust your gut, and you got to trust your heart. If it feels good, feels real, it doesn't matter if it's simple or complicated or loud or soft. It just Make it work, you know. That's great, man. I love it. So, are you working on New Baroness right now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think you're off the road. You're just in writing mode. Yeah, we finished up. Uh, we just um, had a new guitar player join the band and did a summer tour in Europe and the UK. How's that? It was great. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. So now that that's done, it's time to make a new record. Cool, man. So. Um, I won't go too deep into it because I'm sure you've been beaten over the head with the accident. Um, but I'm curious that first, the first couple of shows coming back out of that, was, was that really emotional for you? Was that really hard mentally? I mean, physically, I'm sure there were problems. But. Yeah, I mean, f physically, I, I, uh, in some ways, the shows were physically difficult enough that uh, the mental difficulty got <laughs> slightly overshadowed by, you know, by, some, by some realities like... Uh, my balance and you know some of the chronic pain issues were there at, in high enough supply during those first few shows that uh, any any anxiety that would uh, like hinder my performance was uh, rendered null and void. Mm. But the emotion, you know, the emotion that I remember, the, the the takeaway for me from those shows was overwhelmingly positive because. When uh, you know when the dust had settled from that accident, and uh, and I had I realized how just seriously how completely uh, damaged I had I had become. It was very unclear whether or not touring or even writing music was going to be an option in the future. So I set my you know I sort of set my goals based on uh, based on the on the band, and I said you know I think a a huge hallmark in my recovery is going to be the fir those, those first shows, or that, that literally the first show. If we can do that, then I will, I, I will say, I will openly admit that I have recovered, you know, in, in, in whatever way that, that needs to be said. So, you know, at the end of that show, I, I walked off stage and m my heart was filled with joy. Mm. And, you know, and in some ways, every show since then, that's, that's, that's the case because uh, I have some very present uh, rem and real reminders each and every show that, uh, you know, how fragile we are as a species and how easily, uh, you know, something like an injury uh, or a mental, you know, whether it's physical or mental, right. uh, can entirely derail the, you know, the course of your life. Uh, and I like that you mentioned mental. Uh, I struggle from mental illness myself, and I don't have any physical ailments except for losing my voice every once in a while because I put too much emotion into it, but that's a huge thing too. I think the mental side of being a performer and a musician, and I can only assume going through such a heavy thing, that must have been a huge obstacle. But you, you were back out on the road. I mean, you recovered fairly quickly, actually. Yeah, I mean, we were... <laughs> I, mean, I think I was, in, in hindsight, I was a little cavalier about yeah. the way... <laughs> The way we the way it's we did that because, because uh, you know our, our drummer and bass player decided to quit and um, I didn't you know there was no hard feelings there I thought I thought at many points in the you know preceding months after they left I thought well maybe they maybe they were they made a better decision than I did but you know inwardly no I mean this is this you know I I needed to continue um, so. You know, it was it was sort of difficult because we, 50% of our band, mm. uh, especially, uh, you know, Alan, our drummer, who'd been in the band since day one, uh, had left, and that shook our confidence 
in the way that it should have. Right. You know, it would have been disrespectful if it hadn't. Uh, so, I, you know, I, Pete and I knew that we had to we had to get something going, and we didn't have we didn't really have a rhythm section. So, the idea was, why don't we book a tour? And if we have a tour on the books and it's shows good. line up, then we we will have to have a rhythm wow. section. And the big, you know, the big question mark there was <laughs> whether or not I'd physically be able to like stand and, you know, move enough of my body to, to play music. Uh, how long? But did I you just trusted it. I trusted. I trusted that it would work. At that point, how long did you give yourself? How long was the tour booked? Like months? We were talking about months, uh, weeks. It must have been about four <laughs> months in advance. Three or four months in advance, I would think. And you pulled it together. That's incredible. Yeah, it was. I don't know. I was so myop. I've been so myopic at times since since that accident about, you know, pushing forward uh, because it seems like there's so many reasons not to. Uh, that you know, I just I have to put these like pretty intense blinders on just to just to move forward. And when I do, it feels like things happen naturally and easily. Uh, we you know we didn't work very hard to find Nick and Sebastian. And the startling thing was they were perfect fits. They were the first guys and they were also the right guys oh, wow. so you know when we had that when we had that lined up uh you know it was <laughs> there was a couple little hiccups on the way to the first show uh, like uh, i did get hit by a car when i was Jeez, running dude are you serious uh -huh. <laughs> and it's a long it's Nothing's a longer story stop you, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, i'm not you know i wasn't i didn't make it particularly easy on myself Jesus. But I think I think you know I think we just we believe we believe what we were doing was yeah. the right thing to do. There's no option. Basically, it wasn't really no an option. option. It yeah. felt right. It felt you know it felt good. It, it didn't feel like we were you know pushing to have our band because because we needed something from the band uh, as much as it was just a good constructive goal to have because it would push us through mental roadblocks. Mm. It would push us through the physical roadblocks, and you know falling off a cliff in a bus and being injured like that like y there's gonna be some traumatic stress after that happens no matter what getting back on a bus that must have been i mean that was easy i thought that was, i you didn't even know. think twice about it no that felt see because every time we hit a rumble strip or anything like i'm immediately like <laughs> and i have yeah never been i don't in know a bus accident. <laughs> i don't know that doesn't freak me out that much i you know honestly it's, it's more when I'm driving around, or when I'm in a car, or v any kind of vehicle, and the weather's the same as it was when I, oh, when I was in the accident, that that, that makes me much more nervous than than being on a bus. Uh, but you know, the the point of it was, and that we we could we we could physically do it, we could mentally do it, not without a whole lot of work, but we could do it. So let's do that because that'll pr that'll prove to us. You know the two of us that, that wanted to continue doing, continue doing that, and you know I should definitely mention our crew who stuck with us uh, through that. Same guys. Oh uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of them oh, stayed. Wow. You know, That's um, awesome. the fact that uh, that we all it, you know that injury didn't knock out our desire to be uh, touring musicians uh, was was really impressive to me, and and it became clear at, you know during that tour that one one of the things that one of the new elements to our band was that people were, were judging us and you know or not judging us but but viewing what we had been through and judging our actions based on you know how difficult that must have been to get through and i i thought well if this band has ever had a platform to say something like nice and earnest and positive this is this is the moment and it should be a sim you know simply put uh, you can get knocked off the horse and get back up. It doesn't matter how hard you're knocked off. You can get up if you want to. And there was a lot of people, uh, you know, in the in the wake of that accident, who, who, you know, like friends of mine, people people I respect, or family members, who said, well, you know, are you gonna are you gonna continue playing music, is or or are you not able to do that anymore? And I, and I said, you know, the the best analogy that I could ever give, and that I that I have yet to give, is uh, I got hurt on the way to work, hmm. you know. Anybody else that gets hurt on the way to work, they get better and they go back to work. That's exactly what I did. And that's, you know, exactly what anyone can do if you want to, you know. Right, if, right. If, if you can, if you physically can, if you, if, 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 if you know, the reality exists that, that uh, you know, 
everything still works and everything still works and everything still works just do it you just do it and you you, know, uh, you, you sort of have to be like pig-headed and and not listen to those little uh you know daily anxieties and fears or you know any of those things that can shake your confidence enough to to, to halt you you just have to you just have to block them out uh and then you get through it and you know surprise at the end of that you feel good about your accomplishment you know it's it was touring felt like a real accomplishment at that point where whereas in the past it was a, a fantastic adventure to go on ever since then you know more than you know my appreciation for the life that i didn't lose or my appreciation for you know this strength that whatever strength is still left in my arm more so than that is uh the fact that these things that that have happened to me and to you know to some of the other guys who who I don't like to speak for directly, but mm. things that you know the fact that we went through this thing was really really tough and really hurt and is never going to stop hurting. The fact that we just got through it and got back up on stage and wrote a record, the sense of accomplishment there is genuine. I don't. It's not. It's not. I don't have some overbearing pride about it. I feel inwardly proud. I feel. Like I accomplished something that I myself doubted uh, the reality of, and that allows me to feel justified in, in you know continuing my existence as a musician and as an artist. Right on, man. Well spoken. So I have something a little more superficial to yeah, ask. Yeah, I love superficial too. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, honestly, um, very enlightening to hear you speak. It's great, man. It's inspiring. As a vocalist, you, your voice is very emotive. I, I love the, the melodic sort of yelling that you do. <clears throat> and I have trouble here and there because I go back and forth with, with, sonically with my voice. And I know you've had trouble here and there. What, if, what do you do, the balance between <clears throat> being present with your music, mm -hmm. performing it, and then realizing that there's a certain amount of technique involved to preserve it. How, how has that journey been for you as a vocalist? Um, it started off as a very difficult one, and uh, there were two, two things that really pushed me into a place where I feel some level of confidence and where I feel some level of accomplishment. The first was when, you know, when our band had been reduced to ashes and, you know, we had reassembled and we were starting to write Purple, um, that the that the three other guys in the band, Pete, Sebastian, and Nick, uh, when I was starting to, you know, apply vocals to, you know, some of the demos that we had, and I was questioning certain directions and everything, the three of those guys told me, like, as if I should have known it, and as if it had been reality all along, and I just, it was a surprise to me that, they, that you know, they said, look, y your voice sounds great when you do this thing. like." It's, it's strong when you do this. And I'd never heard anybody say anything, you know, I'd never heard anybody say that directly to me, you know. Mm. Uh, and then, it was, you know, it was sort of at, at the point where my band explained to me something about the instrument that I use that I was entirely unaware of. You know, just some, 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 emo some of the emotive qualities, some of the tonal qualities and some of, some of the performance things that I take for granted because I can only do things, you know, in one little sort of restricted way. When they uh, illuminated that as a good thing for me, you know, as, as a strength that I had, that gave me pause and that, uh, you know, that forced me to look at what it was about that that, uh, that my voice brought to the table that, you know, was unique or something. I, I don't know. It's still a little bit mysterious to me, but I did recognize that it was, you know, uh, something in something in the power to emote, you know, mm. and generally like sort of heftier things. I found that uh, a lot of kids that I talked to after shows were sharing their difficult life stories with me. Uh, which I took as a huge, you know, a huge responsibility uh, to to pay attention to and listen to and, you know, and try to understand. When I realized that that coupled with, you know, the things that, that the, my band had told me, coupled with the, a lot of the, you know, super descriptive words that reviewers like to use when, when describing my voice, I realized that my voice, the, the power of my voice was as 
an emotional voice, not as a technical mm. voice or not as a pure voice, but as something that could, uh, that's, that always seemed to have some sort of emotional content to it, um, which was good because that's the way I've always written music. Mm. I just didn't think I was, I didn't, honestly didn't think I was doing it that well. But you're well. conveying it over, I like how you said that, it's more emotional than it is about the technique. Um, and it's obvious when it hits the ears, it's obvious. I believe every word you fucking say yeah. on those records. It's well, I mean, I, that, that's the other thing is like, I can't, I, I have to, as part of the writing process is like, I have to write things that come, that come from my experience. They mm -hmm. have to be things that I have some understanding with or else they come like, off as likewise. insincere. Likewise. But then once, once I knew that, then the, you know, I'd been studying technique for a couple years at that point. Uh, and I had some breakthroughs, you know, in order, you know, in order to keep my voice on tour, mm. uh, in order to sing a slightly lower volume and, and sing yeah. different styles because I, I yeah. became interested in singing. Yep. The volume thing was a big thing for me because I'm just from being from hardcore, <clears throat> I would push, push, push. Yeah, and that's that was so. So the next thing, the most critical thing, or one of the, one of the most critical things the past couple of years is I met a vocal coach who didn't want to ruin that, didn't want me to stop pushing mm. everything I had out of me, uh, but who wanted to teach me that there is, is a, a right, is, is there's a, Melissa Cross? yeah, she taught me that there's a right she's, way and a wrong way to Yoda. do it. <laughs> yeah. And she, you know, she specifically doesn't do the loud singer thing with me. She, she, she and I had, had a discussion as, uh, as, you know, with my classical range in mind and how that doesn't, you know, it, a classical range for somebody who sings like me doesn't matter because uh, I'm not playing classical music. Right, so right. I can I can push above, I can dig below, uh, but I know how know how to use that. I know how to access the my genuine voice immediately without fatigue. Mm. And since you know, since the first time that I spoke with her, and we 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 talked about the anatomy of a voice, uh, I haven't I have not lost my voice. In it's the way amazing. that I used, in, in the way that I used to. Yeah, she's changed me. She's saved, saved me for sure. Because I've been down and out a bunch. Yeah, and it, and it happens. Oh, it happened to me in the. You know, we were doing, recording Blue Record, and I lost it, and we just had to do other stuff for a couple of days. Right. <laughs> we were at vocals. Yeah. And pretty much everything else done. So then we just had to like, kind of mess around for a couple of days until my voice came back, and I, I just didn't want that to happen again. And then the crazy thing was, you know, once I once I started taking up with Melissa, and and you know, prior to that, when I when I studied the voice myself and started looking into the anatomy and the mechanics of, of vocals, I realized it was the one instrument left that I hadn't spent time mm, yeah. investigating. Like I right investigate on. my guitar. I want to yeah. know all the nooks and crannies. I, you know, pianos, instruments that I don't play. Uh, you know, I, well, I guess I do play bass a little bit, but, you know, I was looking, I, w I would get really involved in all the, the gear stuff and, and uh, you know, to the point where I'm like trying to make things and this, that, and the other thing. And then the most important tool that I have, the, you know, the, the instrument that I don't put down is the one that I've done the least work investigating and, and studying. So guilty yep. after a little bit of studying and some, and a lot of comprehension, I now, I now feel comfortable, you know, walking out on the stage. Yeah. Like I, I know what to expect. It's you know, sometimes it, there's good nights and there's bad yeah, nights, yeah. but you can say that about every other instrument I play yeah. too. So thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, I'm, my uh, pleasure. It was, it was great hearing you talk about music and your art and big inspiration and I, I'm a huge fucking fan of your music. Mm -hmm. Thank you, man. Appreciate, Appreciate it. You. Yeah, thank you for taking the time.